It's a little bit of what we do at Christmas around my house. We sing a little bit and pound on the piano and have a good time. I was interested this year to notice my nieces and nephews are all taking piano lessons. So they had a little mini recital in our front room and it was really, really cool. I want to begin to talk about the idea of starting over. How many of us have said that to someone or to a friend? If I could only start over. Well, guys, this is our last Sunday of 2012, and a lot of things have happened this year. A lot of really good things, and a lot of things that were really tough. But we've made it. This week starts a new year, 2013. I can't, I can't believe it. I remember when the year 2000 was like a big deal, you know. Y2K and all that stuff. 2013 is coming up. And you know, it's nice to remember things that happen, isn't it? I was thinking back a year ago at uh, some of you sitting here this morning were here a year ago. Maybe even the person you're sitting next to wasn't here a year ago. And it's exciting to see that God is still touching lives and changing folks and bringing them to church. It's so exciting. And the great things that happen to us personally can carry over into a new year. Sometimes when we look back at how things were, we get a little depressed. We get a little upset. We start saying to ourselves, why can't I change that if I could start over? We serve a God that is a God of second chances. We serve a God that loves us to come to Him and ask to start over. This year as I was going back through things, I started asking myself some questions. Some questions for this new year, perhaps some challenges for me. And I asked myself, how are we going to grow this next year? Now that could mean a lot of things to folks. It could mean spiritually. It could mean relationships. It could mean with maybe a family member. That relationship isn't the best. How are we going to grow? How are we going to build on our relationships that we currently have? How are we going to strengthen our marriages and our families? And how are we going to invest in our lives? Dr. David Jeremiah, I had the privilege to study under for uh, uh, two years. He's a wonderful man. And this week in his uh, teaching, he shared with us the element of time. We all have the same amount of time every day. The same seconds in every day are available to us all. How do we manage that time? You see, to invest in our lives, sometimes it takes time. To invest in family members and relationships, it takes time. To help your children turn out the way you feel they should be, takes time, takes prayer, lots of prayer. Everything that I felt I needed to look at this next year all boiled down to one four-letter word, time. Well, I take the time to make those things happen. How significant is 2013 going to be for us? It depends on the time you invest in it. 
If I want to grow spiritually, what do I need to do this next year? I need to read his word, don't I? If I want to invest in my family this next year, what do I need to do? I need to spend time with them. If I want to lose weight this year, it takes time, doesn't it? You see, everything that we do takes time. Is this going to be a year where we look at or are defeated by failures? <laughs> Or is it going to be a, a year when we trust in God and find Him to be faithful in all things? God is faithful in all things. But sometimes it takes a while to get through here and to sink in. Once it gets through here, it's got to get down here. I want us to look Kind of back at our Christmas story a little bit. Here in Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 through 23. And this starts on page 682 if you're using a blue Bible. But I want us to spend just a little bit of time here and look at these verses real quick. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up. He said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. <laughs> so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt, I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinities who were two years old and under. In accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warmed in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth and was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your precious holy word. And Father God, we pray that these words that we read this morning will come alive in our lives. That we'll understand in context what your word was saying to us. That will draw knowledge and strength from your holy word this morning, Lord. I thank you for all those who have come out this morning to worship. For all those who will be listening, Father God. We just pray that these words will be used to encourage us and to strengthen us in our walk with you. Father God, this morning we pray that our minds will be open. And our hearts will receive this morning as the Holy Spirit deals with us personally. 
Lord, just be with us as we look into your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I could only begin again. Look at Joseph. Joseph was going to divorce Mary, wasn't he? We learned that several weeks ago that he looked to God and he said, no way. But an angel appeared to him in a dream and told him to take her as his wife. What did Joseph do? He took her as his wife. They're then there in a stable awaiting. All the gifts are coming. Everything's beautiful. And what does God say to him? Get up and go by an angel in a dream. He had to start over. He's now in Egypt waiting. And God said, pick up and go. <coughs> he had to start over. He went back to home and God said, no, go to Nazareth. Pick up. Start over. Everything that we see in Joseph's life was a transition. Preparing Jesus to be the fulfillment of prophecy given five, six, seven, eight hundred years before his birth. I think most of us have said at one time, I'm sorry, haven't we? <coughs> Would you forgive me? Perhaps we failed. We have regret. I was shoveling snow yesterday, working along, and, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to call Lynn real quick. And, and I called Lynn on my cell, and I got it in my pocket on speakerphone, and I'm talking and, and shoveling, and, and Lynn wanted to visit a little bit. And I got rather short with her. Because I really didn't want to visit. I just, every Saturday morning, I give her a call and let her know what's going on. And later on that day, I was down to Mom's, and Lynn walks in the door, and I grabbed her hand. I said, Lynn, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have got short with you. That was an opportunity. I thought, oh, I'll see her tomorrow. I'll talk to her tomorrow. She shows up. I didn't expect her to show up. She showed up. It was an opportunity. Now, could have I sat there in the chair and ignored her and kept right on visiting? Sure. But I recognized it as an opportunity that God provided me to make things right with her. Hopefully she forgave me. I'm sure she did. So we get a fresh start. We get to start over. A fresh start. We have a, two homes in town called Fresh Start. Those gentlemen are given an opportunity <coughs> to change things in their lives. They come to church, some of them, for a short time. And hopefully through our relationship and our visits, we can share with them how important God is. And they would utter those words, could I be born again? A new start, a new leash. This morning, every one of us have witnessed the good news of Jesus Christ. We can say goodbye to this past year and all the headaches and all the troubles, and we can start over. We can start over. God is a God of new beginnings. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 19 tells us, God gives us a new heart. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, He has made us a new creation. And Acts 5.20 tells us, He gives us a new life. How many would like a new life right now? 
Lynn said herself, Oh, my job, do I stay, do I go? We always <coughs> think things could be better. And perhaps 2013 will be. Are you willing to invest in time and energy? This morning I want to look at three principles, real short, I promise. And I think will help us in this new year. We're going to do about three weeks on these principles. We'll look at them a little more in depth. But these three principles are important to each of us. Number one, trust in God's prompting. Trust in God's prompting. You ever been driving down the road and see somebody... I usually say a little prayer. Should I? Shouldn't I? Sometimes I have a check. Keep going. Sometimes I don't. So I stop. We've got to trust in God's prompting. A few months back, we was here on a Saturday. And Lynn was over doing something, and I was doing something, and a fellow showed up in a, in a Lincoln town car and wandered in the doors and I was in some sweats and a t-shirt looking like I usually look. And he said, is the pastor here? I said, well, yes, he is. He goes, where? <laughs> he said, right here. He goes, really? I said, what you need, bud? Is there any way I can get some gas money? I said, sure. But why do you need it? So we went outside and he showed me his tools in his trunk. He had been working up in Jackson, Michigan. He was not a union laborer, got kicked off the job site, was trying to get home to Indianapolis, and was completely out of everything. He said, do you need any painting done? I'll be more than happy to spend a few hours painting whatever. But I need some money for gas. I said, I tell you what I can do. And we hopped in his car. I said, let's drive to Pioneer and I'll put gas in your tank. I'm not going to give you money as long as you promise to bring me back. So I hopped in his car. Away we went. I didn't say anything to Lynn. She's like, what's going on? We got to Pioneer. We filled his tank and on the way back home, he was playing an old Bob Seger tune. And I'm like, oh man, I like Bob Seger. We talked a little bit. And sitting right here in this parking lot, the guy started crying. And he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior before he left Auburn that day. We got to trust in God's prompting. He will speak to us right here in our hearts if we just lift it. Every time an angel appeared to Joseph, Joseph took action. He packed his family. He loaded them up on a donkey and away they went. Every single time he trusted God and he trusted his prompting. He trusted God's providence. Do you recall why Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem in the first place? There was a census, and they had to go to this place to be numbered and to pay taxes. Who likes to pay taxes? None of us. And they didn't back then either. I can just hear all the grumblings and all the problems and all the conspiracy theories and everything going on in Bethlehem about having to drive, walk, stroll, ride on a donkey to this specific place to put down my name as a number and to pay my taxes. People were not happy. But they did it because it was the law. People today are not happy but we do it because it's the law. 
You see, Joseph and Mary and her condition may have decided not to go. But they trusted God's prompting. They went on their way and God provided for them. Finally, we must trust in God's presence. Joseph followed God's direction in going to Egypt, a place he had never been, but he trusted God. Why? To that point, was there any reason why he shouldn't trust God? Didn't God provide for him a beautiful wife? A wonderful son that an angel told him would be the savior of the world. He even gave him the name the angel told him to give him. He trusted God 120%. And anything God said, he did. And God never abandoned him. He was always there. He never left him to fend for himself or to flee on his own. God was always there. That's God's character, guys. That's why when Jesus went to heaven, he said, I will send to you a comforter, my Holy Spirit, who will comfort you, lead you, and guide you in the things of this earth. Joseph knew God would not leave him hanging. So he went boldly to get her done. Went boldly to follow the angel's leading. Went boldly to fulfill the call in his life. I think several of us, a lot of us, got a lot to learn from Joseph. Sometimes I think the more I think about something, the less I am to follow God's true meaning. The more I reason it in my mind, the less I am to walk in the Spirit and follow what He asked me to do. When I got back to the church after my little trip to Pioneer, I shared with Lynn this story. The first thing she said is, why in the world did you ride with him? Why didn't you follow him in your car? You don't know what might have happened. My mom said, oh, Dan, you did it. I was following God's prompting. I was following the call. Didn't have the check that things wouldn't be okay. And do you realize if I would have followed him and said goodbye at Pioneer, that opportunity to share Jesus with him never would have been. He needed time to talk. And he needed time to think. I don't know where he's at today. Hopefully down in Indy doing what God's asked him to do. But we were faithful with our walk and our talk. And God will honor that. How are you doing this new year? How are you doing in your personal life this new year? Are we taking these three principles to trust God, to trust God, and to trust God in all things? Only you can answer that. But I want to let you know, a new year is starting this week. It can be a new life for you this morning. If you're willing to follow, it's up to you. The altars are open. There's people willing to pray. If you need to grab a hand this morning, do that and pray before you leave. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your wonderful word. We thank you for this servant Joseph and how his walk speaks to us speaks to me, Lord, allows me to understand that I need to take time with my family, with my friends, and with you, Lord. We all need to learn more, to trust more, and to be in your presence more, Father God. 
That's why we thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we just pray, Lord, as we depart or head to Sunday school or prepare to come back tonight, Father God, that this Holy Spirit goes before us, prepares our paths, keeps us safe, and keeps, keeps us close to you, Lord. We thank you for a place where we can worship. And we just pray, Father God, that we will do our best to reach out and to help others in this community of Overton. Father God, we love you. We trust in you. And we ask that you be with us this coming week in all things we do and in all things we say. For we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Folks, you are dismissed. Thank you so much.